So it now comes to the stage where we can analyze Yajuj and Majuj and their history from the Khazar Empire to present day. Because something very strange happens in the story of the Khazar Empire. In these lands, there were two major dominant religious forces. There was Christianity in the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and there was the Islamic Khilafat. And the people of the, the steppe, the Mongol Turkic people, were a pagan people. They believed in the sky god Tengri, Guk Tengri, and they had pagan belief systems. Yet a very, very peculiar thing happened to these people, the people of the Khazar Empire, where they adopted the Jewish faith. And this is such a bizarre twist of fate in history that to this day, it has stumped historians. So let's see what historians have to say about the Jewish Khazar state. We must call the reader's attention to the matter of the Khazar kingdom state religion. It was the Jewish faith which became the official religion of the ruling strata of society. So the ruling elite became Jewish. Needless to say, the acceptance of the Jewish faith as the state religion of an ethnically non-Jewish people could be the subject of interesting speculations. And he continues, he says, We shall, however, confine ourselves to the remark that this official conversion in defiance of Christian proselytizing by Byzantium, so Christians sending people for conversion to Christianity in other lands, the Muslim influence from the East, and in spite of the political pressure of these two powers, to a religion which had no support from any political power, but was persecuted by nearly all, has come as a surprise to all historians concerned with the Khazars and cannot be considered as accidental, but must be regarded as a sign of the independent policy pursued by that kingdom. Ibn Fadlan, who was an ambassador and traveled many lands, writes, the Khazars and their king are all Jews. The Bulgars and all their neighbors are subject to him. They treat him with worshipful obedience. Some are of the opinion that Gog and Magog, Yajuj and Majuj are the Khazars. So what happens next? The Khazars adopted the Jewish religion, um, something that has surprised all historians. But what happens next in the story? Following the collapse of the empire, the Judeo-Khazars fled to Eastern Europe. The rise of European Jewry is therefore explained by the contribution of the Judeo-Khazars. This is a quote from The Missing Link of Jewish-European Ancestry Contrasting the Rhineland and the Khazarian Hypothesis by Eran Elhaik, published in Genome Biology and Evolution. So in this paper, this is a quote, they say, we applied a wide range of population genetic analyses. Our findings support the Khazarian hypothesis and portray the European Jewish genome as a mosaic of Near Eastern Caucasus, European and Semitic ancestries. This is the most important sentence in the entire paper. They say, based on this genetic analysis, Contemporary Eastern European Jews comprise the largest ethno-religious aggregate of modern Jewish communities, accounting for approximately 90% of over 13 million Jews worldwide. So what they're saying in this paper is that based on genetic analysis, that 90% of today's Jewish people are in fact descendants of the Khazars, that they are descendants of these people. And they trace the entire timeline of events after the collapse of the empire of the Khazars and how those Judeo-Khazars fled and established new settlements in Eastern Europe. Professor of Medieval Jewish History at Tel Aviv University, A. N. Poliak, by the way, he is a professor of Jewish history at Tel Aviv University in Israel, 
So what he's saying is not anti-Semitic, it's not against Jews, it's just history. What he says is a new approach, both to the problem of the relations between the Khazar Jewry and other Jewish communities, and to the question of how far we can go in regarding this Khazar Jewry as the nucleus of the large Jewish settlement in Eastern Europe, the descendants of this settlement, those who stayed where they were, those who emigrated to the United States and to other countries, and those who went to Israel, constitute now the large majority of world Jewry. What are these people saying? What is this professor of medieval Jewish history at Tel Aviv University and this scientist, Aaron al -Haik? What are they trying to tell us? What they're saying is this. The vast majority of modern-day Yehudis are in fact descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. They are from the lineage of Yajuj and Majuj. They are from the Khazar people. And they have no genetic link to the Prophet Ibrahim and the original people of Israel. And the most surprising fact is that today, the major sect of modern Jews call themselves Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazi Jews, you can look this up. Deriving from Ashkenaz, the nephew of Magog. They even call themselves Ashkenazi Jews. Now, I will point out that there are some medieval writings where rabbis began to use the word Ashkenaz to describe Germany. This was done on purpose to confuse the history of these people, but make no mistake. The Ashkenazi Jews derive their name from Ashkenaz, the nephew of Majuj. And out of the estimated 10 million Ashkenazi Jews today, around 6 million live in the United States and 3 million live in Israel. Now, Ashkenazi Jews, when they went to Europe after the collapse of the Khazar Empire, as the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj, formed some of the world's wealthiest and influential family empires, such as the Rothschilds, which grew their wealth to enormous proportions by lending money on interest to people, companies, and eventually nations. This is a very famous phrase from Nathan Meyer Rothschild. And it's at this point now that you can start to establish the connection that we made at the very beginning about the impact of Yajuj and Majuj on the history of Britain, the political and financial and military impact. So Nathan Meyer Rothschild says, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls the British money supply controls the British empire and I control the British money supply. So what is the history of Yajuj and Majuj and their descendants with the British Empire? The Rothschild family played a key role in financing Britain's military campaign against France during the early 1800s, paying for arming, feeding and clothing soldiers fighting against Napoleon's French army. In 1815 alone, the Rothschilds provided a 9.8 million pound loan which is around 710 million pounds in modern day terms to Britain's continental allies. So they were giving almost a billion dollars equivalent in loan to the British Empire. The essential support of the Rothschild family helped Britain achieve a decisive victory over France in the Battle of Waterloo, leading to the unchallenged global dominance and rise of the British Empire. So now it makes sense when people say that the wealth and prestige of London was built on the hard work of Gog and Magog. Now it comes full circle. What else did the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj do? Well, the Ashkenazi Jews then went on to create the Zionist movement, which aimed to establish the state of Israel in the historic lands of Palestine whose efforts were 
primarily financed and supported by the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds brought, bought large swathes of lands to build early Jewish settlements in Palestine, and today many buildings and roads in Israel are named after the Rothschilds. But in order for this to happen, Yajuj and Majuj first needed to destroy the Islamic Khilafat and the Sultanate Osmania, the Ottoman Empire, which at the time, before World War I, was administrating and ruling over Palestine. And Yajuj and Majuj used the same playbook that they used with Britain in the Napoleonic War. They came to the financial aid of Britain in World War I against the Sultanate Osmania and Islamic Khilafat to ensure their destruction. And this contract between Yajuj and Majuj and Britain to establish the state of Israel is so clear. And it's actually, this is a quote from the RothschildArchive.org, which says, beginning in 1916, the British hoped that in exchange for their support of Zionism, so in exchange for the Britain's support of Yajuj and Majuj to create the state of Israel, they would help to finance the growing expenses of the First World War, which was becoming increasingly burdensome. So the British were saying, okay, Yajuj and Majuj, you give us the financial support, and once we win, we will give you what you want, we'll give you Palestine. But there was a second part to the deal. Because Britain didn't just want money, Britain needed military aid. And so the Foreign Office believed that Yajuj and Majuj could be prevailed upon to persuade America, the United States, to join World War I. Without American military power, Britain would have lost World War I and the Islamic Khilafat would still be here today. Sultanate Osmania and Islamic Khilafat collapsed and the Palestinian lands came under British rule. So this plan of Yajud and Majud, Britain and America worked. And the seeds for the state of Israel were planted on this day. But this begs the question, how is it that the Jews, the Yajud and Majud, could be prevailed upon to persuade America to enter the war? Why is it that the British believed that not only could they give, a, give money for the war, but they could bring America's military force onto their side? Well, it's very simple. Because once you control money in Europe, once you control money in Britain, you can also go and control money in America. That's exactly what Yajuj and Majuj did. They emigrated from Europe to Britain, from Britain to America, and they used their influence they used the same playbook of lending money of interest, establishing financial institutions, and becoming the core centers of economic power in whichever country they went. This is the story of the 1907 economic collapse, and it talks about J.P. Morgan, a very famous banker, an Ashkenazi Jew, and a descendant of Yajuj and Majuj. And it says, during the bank panic of 1907, Wall Street turned to J.P. Morgan to steer the country through the crisis that was threatening to push the economy over the edge into a full crash and depression. Morgan, one man, was able to convene all the principal players at his mansion and command all their capital to flood the system, thus floating the banks that in turn helped to float the businesses until the panic passed. The fact that the US government owed its economic survival to a private banker forced necessary legislation to create a central bank and the US Federal Reserve. So Yajuj and Majuj funded the entire US economic system in the financial collapse of 1907 and without their support, without their money, the U.S. economy was finished. Now it becomes clear why Yajuj and Majuj had leverage over America and they could bring America into this war. That contract that Yajuj and Majuj made with Britain after they won World War I was written 
in the clearest possible English right here in the Balfour Declaration, which says from the British Foreign Office to Mr. Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's Government the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. The reason I'm showing this to you is I want to just emphasize how these people, through their control of money, through their control of power, leverage entire empires, entire governments to achieve their aims over a long period of time. Aims that you would think maybe are impossible, but by pulling the strings, by cranking the levers of control through finance as the center linchpin, these people, the Yajuj and Majuj, are able to establish their power on a global scale. And they were successful. They were able to establish in Palestine the State of Israel. This is a little video which shows the day that actually happened. ביום שישי, ה' באייר תש"ח, 14 במאי 1948, אחר הצהריים, באו המוזמנים אל בניין מוזיאום תל אביב בשדרות רוטשילד 16. הם התבקשו לשמור את סיבת 16. סי? תל אביב בשדרות רוטשילד 16. הם התבקשו לשמור את סיבת ההזמנה, טקס הכרזת העצמאות, בסוד. אבל בבואם מצאו את חצי העיר ממתינה להם. סמוך לשעה ארבע הגיע דוד בן גוריון. So there came David Ben Gurion and went on to declare the independent state of Israel. And this is a letter from the Jewish Agency for Palestine to the American president. Again, it shows the levers of power and the control and influence that Yajuj and Majuj have over the American government. It says, with full knowledge of the deep bond of sympathy which has existed and has been strengthened over the past 30 years between the government of the United States and the Jewish people of Palestine. What is 30 years less 1948? It's 1918, just after the First World War, around the same time as the Balfour Declaration. This is the culmination of the plan of Yajuj and Majuj to establish the state of Israel. And later on in this presentation, I will help explain why they went through all of this trouble to establish the state of Israel in Palestine because it is part of a much bigger and a much more evil and a much more sinister plan. But Yajuj and Manjuj did not stop there in their quest for global domination. They went on to create institutions like the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. And these institutions lend money on interest to poor countries, Muslim countries, and entrap them in loans and debt which they cannot repay. Harry Dexter White was an Ashkenazi Jew. Jew, one of the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. He was the intellectual founder of the IMF and the World Bank. He served as its acting managing director and played a highly influential role during the IMF's first year. This man, Klaus Schwab, who is the founder of the World Economic Forum, runs this institution which gathers the world's most influential politicians and global business leaders they meet every year in Davos, Switzerland, and they hatch out schemes and plans that relate to the global policy that countries will adopt over the next five and 10 years. People say he controls the world and world policy. Well, Klaus Schwab, Schwab is actually just the German version of an Ashkenazi Jewish name. 
and according to some sources, he is actually from the bloodline of the Rothschild family. But if you look at this on a larger scale, Yajuj and Majuj control positions of power and influence on the global stage in an unprecedented way across all spheres from politics, banking, finance, and media. Let's look at finance. Let's look at just six companies, the Blackstone Group, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Chase & Co, BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, and Charles Schwab. These six companies are all founded by and run by the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. And just these handful of companies manage over $25 trillion in assets. That's trillion with a T. That's such a big number, it's hard to imagine. So let me break this down for you. One trillion dollars is one thousand billion dollars. They manage twenty-five thousand billion dollars. And you have countries like Pakistan begging for a three billion dollar loan from the IMF. In the social media space, you have Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and YouTube, all platforms founded by and run by the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. And every day, over 6 billion people log on to and visit these platforms. And they consume their media, their news, they communicate through these platforms, and they are fully under the control and management of Yajuj and Majuj. Google, the world's biggest search engine and source of information for all people online, is run by and controlled by the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. Oracle, which runs the infrastructure, the, the enterprise compute infrastructure for so many systems worldwide run by Ashkenazi Jews. Apple, the manufacturer of the devices which I'm sure maybe 20% of the people watching have in their pocket right now, run by, owned by, founded by the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. Dell, the manufacturer of computers, run by, founded by, managed by the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. These four companies alone have a market capitalization of over five trillion US dollars. And if you look at the media space, if you look at television, news, cinema, it is a complete monopoly. Yajuj and Majuj control the entire media sphere, from Warner Brothers to CNN, Netflix and HBO, Bloomberg, CNBC, Sky News, Comcast, Universal Studios, DreamWorks Pictures, and Fox News. And I have you know, Muslims telling me, oh, you know, we, we can't see the Palestinians on the news. We can't see what's happening to them on the news. We only hear one side of the story. Of course you hear one side of the story because the entire narrative is owned by the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj. Why would they make themselves look bad? Of course they're not going to show you the plight of the Palestinians. Why would they do that? And understand this. If you control media, and you control technology, and you control how people communicate, and social media, and you control finance, then you control politics, and you have power. And with these institutions, you have power on a global stage. But the most remarkable thing of all is that this historical analysis which we have done about Yajuj and Majuj as being descendants from the Scythians to the Gok Turks, the Khazar Empire, the historical analysis which spoke about their Khazar Empire conversion to Judaism and how the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj are now at the highest points in all aspects of society today, 
how they have the levers of power and control in their hands, this entire historical account is told to us in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us this entire story in Surah al -Anbiya, and only in two ayat. That is the miracle of the Quran. That is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words. So let's begin by analyzing verse 95 of Surah Anbiya. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وحرام على قرية أهلكناها أنهم لا يرجعون. What is being said in this ayat? Let's see the word by word translation. وحرام and prohibition على upon قرية a city أهلكناها which we have destroyed annahum that they la not yarjiuna so the word by word translation says and prohibition upon a city which we have destroyed that they will not return what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in this ayat is that the inhabitants of a city which has been destroyed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are prohibited to return to that city. There is a ban on them to return to the city that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destroyed. And so many times in the Quran, we have seen examples of nations, of people, of cities that were destroyed, and every single time they were completely annihilated. There was a ban on them, there was a prohibition, those people were destroyed, they will never ever return to that city. So this is verse 95. What does verse 96 say? Hatta ida futihat ya ajuja wa ma ajuja wa hum min kulli hadabin yansiluna. Okay. And let's read the translation of this ayat. This ayat is perhaps the most important ayat. And this is the one that we must pay the most attention to in order to unpack the meaning of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us. So Sahih International say that the inhabitants of a city which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destroyed are prohibited to return to that city until when Gog and Magog, Yajuj and Majuj have been opened and they from every elevation descend. Okay. Then Pikthal says, until when Yajuj and Majuj are let loose and they hasten out of every mound. Yusuf Ali says, until Yajuj and Majuj are let through and they swiftly swarm from every hill. Shakir says, even when Yajuj and Majuj are let loose and they shall break forth from every elevated place. Muhammad Server says, until Yajuj and Majuj are let loose to rush down from the hills. Mohsen Khan says, until when Yajuj and Majuj are let loose and they swiftly swarm from every mound. And Arbi says, till when Yajuj and Majuj are unloosed and they slide down from every slope. Now, unfortunately, all of these translations are incorrect. And you can tell that because they are inconsistent. There is an internal inconsistency between the translations. The translators are not sure how to translate this meaning. That's why they have to insert phrases. They have to insert the dam, the barrier, the people, because it's not so clear what is the meaning that is being conveyed. Here we're seeing that Yajuj and Majuj have been opened. Here they're let loose. Here they're let through. Here they are from every elevation descending. Here they're hastening out of every mount here they're swarming from every hill here they're from every elevated place here they're from coming down every slope so there's clearly an internal confusion between these different translations so we need to understand why is it that the translators have chosen this form of the translation and the answer is very simple because the translators each have a mental model of what they think is supposed to happen all of the translators imagine in their mind's eye yajuj and manjuj doing something like this
right? If this is your mental model, this is what you think is being said, then when it comes to the words, that's the model that you will apply to the translation. You'll try and fit the translation to your mental model. Whereas what should be done is that the words should be analyzed. And even if they don't match your mental model, the translation should be written as is. So let's analyze the keywords. There are three keywords that form the basis of this translation and will resolve the confusion that you've seen in all of the other translations. The first is Futihat, the second is Hadabin, and the third is Yansiluna. Now, Futaha, Fetiha, is the root of this word. In Arabic, all words have three root letters, and based on the context, there can be a different meaning of that word. Now, the translators have said meanings like let loosened or opened. Fata can mean opening. It can mean victory. It can mean those things. But in this context, futiha, futiha doesn't mean that. Futihat means such a one who has become fortunate, being fortunate, being possessed of good fortune, being favored by the world or by worldly circumstances. It has nothing to do with opening. What does Hadibin mean? Hadibin has the root He, De, Be, which means high. That does not mean a mountain, does not mean a high place, it just means high or elevated. And this word, Yansiluna, is the most important word in this ayat that forms the key part of the entire meaning of the ayat. The translators translate Yansaluna as descending, as descending physically down a slope or descending physically from a height. But the root of Yansaluna is Nasl. What does Nasl mean? Nasl means progeny. It is not descending, it is the descendants. It is the line of people who descend from you. And in a verb form, it just means the progeny is. The reason that there is a confusion here is because in English, there's no verb for progeny. Progeny just it doesn't have that verb form. In Arabic, it is, but in English, there isn't. Yan Saluna really is where the progeny are, where the progeny operates from. So based on this form of the translation, the ayat means until when possessed of good fortune, Yajuj and Majuj, and they from every high station, progeny is. That's the word for word translation. But the meaning, the meaning of the ayat is that until when Yajuj and Majuj are possessed of good fortune and their progeny operate from every high station. And in common speak, in English, we say this right? Heights. What does height mean? It can mean a high place or a hill, or it can mean a high level of success. You reach the heights of, he reached the heights of his profession. You scale heights, not a mountain. You share prices scaled new heights yesterday. You rise to the dizzy, lofty heights. All of the translators, because of their mental model, are assuming that it's a hill. Whereas what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is the height in a metaphorical sense. Even in English, we say that that person is a high-ranking official. That person is part of high society. That is what is being said about the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj, that they will be on all the heights, like we've shown. They'll be in the heights of politics. They'll be in the heights of finance. They'll be in the heights of media. They'll be in the heights of the whole world. And when you combine Ayat 95 with Ayat 96, the meaning becomes so clear, so transparent. It becomes so apparent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the inhabitants of a city which Allah has destroyed are prohibited to return to that city until when Yajud and Majud are possessed of good fortune and their progeny, 
their descendants operate from every high station. I've shown you in this presentation that the second part of this ayat is true. So which people is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about? Who are the people of that city which Allah has destroyed and put a ban on that were now able to return because the Ajud and Majud have good fortune and their progeny are now in the heights of all stations of the world? The answer is simple. It is the Bani Israel. And the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948 was the fulfillment of this prophecy about Yajud and Majud, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. The return to the homeland of the Jews to Israel in 1948 was an astounding event, unprecedented in world history. Never had a decimated ancient people managed to retain their individual identity through almost 20 centuries, 2,000 years, and re-establish their nation in their original homeland. The Bani Israel are the only people in history who were destroyed by Allah, and those people have now returned to the city that was destroyed, the city of Jerusalem. And if you look at the official Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, they state this goal as the essential core part of the purpose of the State of Israel. The Israeli Declaration of Independence says, the State of Israel will be opened for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exiled these people. He exiled the Jews. They were banned. They were removed from those lands. And the State of Israel is open for their return. The Declaration of Independence states, We appeal to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora to rally around the Jews of Eretz Israel, that is the old name of Israel, in the tasks of immigration and upbuilding, and to stand by them in the great struggle for the realization of the age-old dream, the redemption of Israel, the redemption of the Bani Israel, and their return to the city that was destroyed, their return to their home. This is the prophecy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us about in Surah Anbiya. And you might say to me that, well, this is quite a lot of interesting linguistic analysis, but how can you be certain that this is the meaning? How can you be sure that this is the interpretation? Well, number one, this entire interpretation makes sense with the full historical analysis. And number two, don't take my word for it. Look at the words of Alama Iqbal in his famous poem, which reads, Kul gay ya jood or ma jood ki lashkar tamam. Chashme Muslim dekhle tafsire harfe yansalum. Alama Iqbal is drawing our attention to this same issue in translation. He is saying, Gog and Magog, ya jood and ma jood have all been released. At the time of his writing, they have all been released. Let the Muslims perceive and understand the meaning of Yan Silun. Yan Silun, this key word that changes the entire meaning from not Gog and Magog coming down a hill, descending down a hill, actually changes the meaning to what it really is. That they will be possessed of good fortune, their progeny will operate from every high station, and once this happens, the people who were destroyed will return to the city on which there was a ban for their return. Today, 
The people who were destroyed, the Bani Israel, have indeed returned to their ancient homeland, and the descendants of Yajuj and Majuj operate at the highest positions and sources of power around the world.